Good afternoon and a warm welcome to you all to this EPF webinar to explore all things related to the COVID vaccines. My name is Nicola Bedlington and I'm the Special Advisor to the European Patients Forum and I have the honour of moderating today's event. And we're in excellent company. In a few moments, EPF President Marco Greco will have given an introduction and outline the specific objectives of this afternoon's webinar in the context of EPF's broader work on vaccines. And I will then interview Professor Jean-Michel Donnier and Professor Guido Razi, both renowned scientists and experts in the field. And these interviews have been broadly based around the questions that you as participants highlighted in the registration, essentially what you'd like to understand about the fundamentals of COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccines, how they are developed and their safety. And following the interviews, there'll be the opportunity for further questions, and we encourage you to add these to the chat function throughout the session, and then we'll try and cluster the key ones at the end. And because time is, is precious and quite limited, we may, may not be able to delve into everything in great detail, but the report of today's meeting will attempt to cover any outstanding matters and any unfinished business. And for the, this reason, we'll be actually recording the entire event and we'll use the opportunity to actually broadcast that on our YouTube to enable the widest possible community to be able to listen and, and learn from the discussions today. I would also encourage you to use Twitter, tweet about what you're hearing, some of the thoughts you have about all of that. And the Twitter is hashtag shotcallers. So let's hope we have some dynamic conversation on the Twitter. I hope this is fine with everybody. You're feeling comfortable and ready for a really dynamic and interesting session. And without further ado, allow me to give the floor to EPF President Marco Greco. The floor is yours. Cool. Thank you, Nicola, and thanks to everybody for being here today and looking at the numbers and the great satisfaction that I'm seeing that this event is already a success uh, from the participation standpoint. I'm sure it will be also a success at the end of the day when it comes to the content. Um, as you know, APF has invested a lot of resources on uh, the issues related around vaccination. It's uh, something we have started two years ago with a long standing project about the safety of the vaccine and the uh, clearness of the information around vaccination, also in order to tackle the issues related to the growing issues related to the acceptance of vaccination as, a, as, a therapy, as an option. Um, what has happened with the pandemic uh, has, be, has found us already in, uh, in first line in uh, this work of information about vaccination. And so we found somehow found some some natural to develop the work also towards the COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, some of the issues, some of the headlines problems are the same, of course, but some are more specific. Um, not only we have presented not later than two weeks ago our guide to vaccination, but also the APF work around that has been heavily uh, increased over the, the past month with a weekly information given to our members. Uh, this was possible thanks also to Professor Jean-Michel Donnier, that is the scientific mind behind the, the, the information that we are delivering. Uh, very often to, to our members. It is essential to, to give correct information. It is essential to clarify doubts in the population. It is essential to make clear uh, what is happening in order to create confidence in, uh, in this essential option for the safety of the, of the population. Um, I would like to, to add just one thing. Um, during the event, of the present, during which we have presented our guide, uh, a lot of questions have been raised about the specific, very specific uh, um, scientific points. For example, uh, what kind of vaccine may better work for a certain category of patients? What kind, if a certain patient under a certain medication can get this vaccine? 
Unfortunately, not all these information are already available. This is also due to the speedness that has been uh, uh, the, somehow the, what has characterized the development of this vaccine. A lot of studies are, um, are still ongoing, uh, but uh, from what we know at the moment, it will be possible today to answer to some of uh, these questions. What is really essential today is that uh, we will allow science to speak because it's important that the information that we provide is reliable from the scientific point of view. And so it's important, as I said, that science is speaking in a very understandable way. For doing this, we have involved these two top players in, in the field, uh, scientists, but also top experts when it comes to the to regulatory. And uh, I have to, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky because I know very well both of them and I know how clear they can be and uh, also how good they are in teaching. They are both coming also from the academic world. And so I'm confident that they will be capable to clarify a lot of the issues uh, around uh, the problems raised in the last days. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I will join you during the final Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco, for that clear introduction. Now we'll move to um, the actual interview with uh, Jean-Michel Donnier. Jean-Michel is head of Department of Pharmacy at the University of Namur. He's also involved in the WHO Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Sa Safety and has been a long-term member of the EMA uh, Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee, the Prague. A very warm welcome to you, Jean-Michel. Let's go then to the very first question. Let's uh, roll our sleeves up and get to it. Very basic, simple question. Um, what types of vaccines are currently being developed for COVID-19 and how do they actually work? So thank you very much for this introduction. So I propose some slide to help the understanding. So if you can go to the next slide. Yes. So a COVID-19 vaccine is a vaccine intended to provide acquired immunity against COVID-19. So it means that vaccines will mimic the immune response by the humans to SARS-CoV-2. The virus uses the surface glycoprotein called spike to connect to a CE2 receptor and enter the host cell. Acquired immunity will occur as a combination of two principles in immunology, the cell-mediated immunity and antibody production. So we can go maybe to the next slide. Yes, and as of January 26, we have 63 vaccines in clinical development and 173 in preclinical development, according to the WHO. We have at least nine different technology platforms to create an effective vaccine against COVID-19, and most are proposed as a two-doses regimen with an intramuscular administration. If you can go to the next slide. To the next slide, please. With the different, yes. So this may be a busy slide, but uh, you will understand uh, from this slide that the most of the platforms of the vaccines candidates in clinical trials are focused on the coronavirus spike protein. And on the left hand side, you see that many vaccine developers use the virus itself in a weakened or inactivated form. And many existing vaccines are made in this way, such as the, uh, those with, against measles and polio. On the middle, you see that others are working on viral vector vaccine. A, vi a virus such as measles or adenovirus is genetically engineered so that it can produce coronavirus protein in the body. On the right hand side, you see in red that others want to inject coronavirus protein, a subunit of the protein, S protein, again, directly into the body. Next slide. And two vaccines have had been authorized by the European Commission. This is the Pfizer, BioNTech, and the Moderna vaccines. Both vaccines work via a novel uh, mRNA. In these vaccines, the mRNA carries instructions to make the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein within the cells. 
the delivery of the mRNA is achieved by a formulation of the mRNA into lipid nanoparticles which protect the RNA strands and help the absorption into the cells. Once the, once the vaccine is injected, the mRNA is taken up by macrophages near the, the injection site, so not the whole body, mainly in the ejection site, and instructs those cells to make the spike protein. Importantly, enzymes in the body then degrade the mRNA. And so, no virus is involved, there is no adjuvant in this vaccine, and again, most importantly, no genetic material enters the nucleus of the cell. So, thank you very much for that very clear explanation. Guy Delcasi, a warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I just wanted to check in. This is obviously an interview with Jean-Michel and we'll be talking to you directly afterwards. But would you have anything to add to, to Jean-Michel's uh, overview, if you like, from your perspective? Well, well, I think it was so clear, uh, at least I'm an Im immunologist, so I found very comfortable in these uh, um kind of simplified still very very accurate uh, description of what the mechanism so i i, I found it difficult to complement okay what was very clear. Good. <laughs> excellent thank you for the affirmation guido so let's move on then um Concerning the mRNA, some people are concerned that this is untested, risky technology, and has been used really quickly for the mass public. But how new is this technology really, Jean-Michel? What's your perspective on that? Uh, so before the COVID-19 pandemic, no mRNA vaccine was licensed for use in humans. So this is true, that is a new technology, but as new technology, it has to be also studied in clinical trials and then used in real life. So the concept is not new uh, in this case. The use of mRNA vaccine goes back to the early 90s. mRNA vaccine for human use have been developed and tested for the disease such as rabies and influenza. Also, these mRNA vaccine have not been licensed. And you know that it's on the 2nd of December 2020 that the UK MHRA, the Medicine and Health Product Regulatory Agency, that became the first global medicine regulators in history to approve an mRNA vaccine for human use, which was the Pfizer and Biotech vaccine. But still, again, I repeat, even if it is new, it is based on robust data on efficacy and safety in highly powered phase three randomized clinical trials. Great. And, and are mRNA vaccines considered safe for everyone? Are there any particular precautions, for example, and this is especially relevant for our audience, certain people with, with chronic conditions, immunocompromised patients, etc. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, so there are two questions. I will address the first and then the second one. For the first one, sure. are mRNA vaccines considered safe for everyone? This is one of the major questions since what we know from the survey on hesitancy of the vaccine is that the safety comes first when you want to be hesitant. So to the question, I will go straight to the point. Are mRNA vaccine considered safe for everyone? I would say yes. Overall, both mRNA vaccines are quite safe. They are classically associated to reactogenic reactions. So it doesn't mean that when I say safe, that they do not have adverse events. They have adverse events. For instance, the most common adverse event is pain at the ejection site. Fatigue and headaches are other relatively common adverse events. High fever, however, are less common. And these adverse events generally resolve within a couple of days. And in general, they are more common in younger vaccine recipients, meaning less than 55, for instance, than in older ones. The second dose is also generally associated with more adverse events than the first dose. Uh, you have heard that reports in post-marketing emerge of vaccine recipients experiencing severe allergic reaction, anaphylaxis for, in, uh, anaphylaxis for instance, shortly after receiving their first dose. First, I want to say that these events are rare and administration of the vaccine includes a period of at least 15 minutes of observation after vaccination. And if a person experiences a severe reaction, 
after the first shot, the person should not receive the second one. But again, it's critically important to emphasize that these allergic reactions are uncommon. The current estimate post-marketing for anaphylaxis, which, which occurs with the Pfizer vaccine, for instance, is approximately one in 100,000. So, uh, uh, so this is for the first uh, uh, question. And the second question, are there any precaution, for example, for certain people with chronic conditions? I would say no at this stage. We have a single absolute contraindication to this vaccine, which is a known hypersensitivity to the vaccine component. But the CDC considers that immunocompromised patients to be at increased risk for severe COVID-19. So it is true that there are limited data on immunocompromised people. And it is also true that immunocompromised people may not respond as well to the vaccines. Uh, but it is also true that there are no particular safety concerns to expect from this population. So in conclusion, immunocompromised people can still be vaccinated as they may be at high risk from COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And I guess linked to this, what can we do additionally to best protect particular groups who cannot actually be vaccinated in any case because of their condition? Okay, so I would respond in two ways. First, protect yourself. Wear a mask, physical distancing, avoid crowds, avoid poorly ventilated space, wash your hands often. And secondly, and we can maybe go to the next slide, vaccinate as much and as quickly as possible to hopefully generate herd immunity. Herd immunity is the indirect protection from an infectious disease that happens when a population is immune either through vaccination or through previous infection. Of course, in this case, from a medical point of view, the aim is to achieve herd immunity, not via the infection, but through the vaccination. It aims at lowering the overall amount of virus able to spread in the whole population and therefore keep the vulnerable groups who cannot get vaccinated safe and protected from the disease. So herd immunity, community immunity is actually key in this context. Moving to a, a wider topic, let's say the vaccines are approved based on their efficacy in preventing symptomatic COVID-19, meaning that the individual who's vaccinated is less likely to get ill or have severe illness effects. But it's not yet known if the vaccines also prevent transmission of the virus. Uh, what are your thoughts? What's your thinking on this? But again, a clear answer, yes. The impact of vaccination on the spread of the virus in the community is not yet, yet known. This was not the end point of the clinical trials. So until we know whether the vaccines protect against asymptomatic infection, we should continue physical distancing, masking, avoiding crowd and regular hand washing. Still, there are several good reasons to be optimistic about the vaccine effect on disease transmission. And indeed some data early shows that even after one dose, some vaccine have a protective effect in preventing asymptomatic infection. And secondly, finding from populated based studies now suggest that people without symptoms or with less symptoms are less likely to transmit the virus to others. So we have good reason to be optimistic in on this purpose. Great, thank you very much. And can I just remind the audience, please do not forget to add any questions or thoughts in the chat and we'll revisit that a little later, but so far so good. Really, um, it's fantastic to get your insight, Jean-Michel, very, very clear. Um, looking at a crystal ball, this is maybe less scientifically oriented, but it'd be really interesting to get your perspective. How long will it be, do you think, uh, until things can get back to normal, let's say, um, as more people are being vaccinated? What's your sort of sense of when we'll get back to the normal as we knew it a few months ago, over a year ago now? Okay, so I try to look in my crystal ball, as you mentioned, uh, but from a scientific point of view, meaning looking at what can be uh, done to reach or to achieve herd immunity. Uh, and so we had some calculations that, that are classically possible, uh, and the percentage of people who need to be immune in order to achieve herd immunity 
varies with each disease, which is the way that they spread, in fact. And for instance, herd immunity against measles requires about 95% of the population to be vaccinated. Uh, the proportion of the population that must be vaccinated against COVID-19 to begin inducing herd immunity is not known accurately, especially since now that we have variants for which it may change also uh, the look, I would say, of the disease. But what we have generally calculated is that for a vaccine with over 80% efficacy that gives lung protections, we estimate that the herd immunity may be achieved with a coverage of minimum 70% and hopefully higher than that. Okay, and clearly a time frame is not possible in this current climate, of course. Okay. The time frame will depend on the vaccine uh, coverage in the different countries and you have heard maybe at the level of the WHO that no one is safe until everybody is safe. Exactly. So not only at national or international level, at EU level, but hope also that uh, many developers and many uh, partnerships will help to have a high coverage in many countries, especially as you know that today we have variants that develop in some countries, such as Brasilia, such as other countries, so we need to vaccinate as much as possible, as rapidly as possible worldwide and not only some countries. Sure. And on the topic of the new variants, which have been well publicised in the media, etc., will the vaccines now approved be effective also against these new variants? That's obviously always a difficult question, especially when the vaccine has been studied in uh, the, I would say, the initial uh, uh, virus. So uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus has many variants, in fact, and some are of particular interest. And indeed, when the um, pharmaceutical industry develops the vaccine, usually they test also some lineage to see if the vaccine produces neutralizing antibodies that would neutralize these variants as well. Current vaccines were designed around earlier variants, as I have said. Okay. And okay. preliminary studies suggest yeah. that the yeah. vaccines may be more protective against some of the variants than the others. And you know that there are two major variant that we are discussing today, the so-called B117, which is the UK variant, and the B1351, uh, which is the South African variant. And some data show that the mRNA vaccine works just as well against variants first detected in the UK, so the B117. And the two mRNA vaccines seem less protective against the variant in South Africa, but still, Studies showing decreased level of antibodies against a new variant does not mean a vaccine is proportionally less effective. We need to address or assess the level of the neutralizing antibody that is still produced and that the protection may still be also expected by the cellular immunity. So I would say what is important now is that, the, that, that all pharmaceutical companies work to study the impact of the vaccine on these variants. We know that mRNA pharmaceutical company mentioned that they are working also on booster shot, a shot to protect again COVID-19 variant. And what is important is that there are some flexibility for some platforms that uh, may provide a new, I would say, vaccine in a period of time of six to eight weeks. So from a practical perspective, the discovery of this variant does not change the basic recommendation for a rapid vaccination today. Great. Very clear messages. Thank you very much, Jean-Michel. I'd now like to move to Guido Rassi. As many of you will know, the former director, executive director of the European Medicines Agency. Again, a warm welcome to you, Guido. Um, first question from, from the audience. Normally, the development of a vaccine takes several years. Please, can you explain to us how the EMA was able to approve COVID-19 vaccines so quickly in this current environment? Well, um, there are two, uh, three basic reasons for this uh, fast uh, approval. The first and the most important has been the availability of uh, um, volunteers to be recruited in the uh, clinical trials. Generic recruitment of clinical trials takes months 
and in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the infectious disease, you need to have this population exposed to the virus. While the pandemic consented to have uh, constantly a high number of volunteers constantly exposed to the virus, so it was uh, kind of easy to uh, collect the data. And that is the most important um, speed factor, if I may call it like that. The second has been the incredible number of resources allocated to this. And the resources were both uh, human resources, a platform, unique platform where a lot of developers could use the same data. For example, the sequencing for RNA, they use the same technology that has been developed. And of course, if you allocate uh, uh, 10 people to build a bridge, or if you allocate 100 people to build the same bridge, you can understand that the outcome and the speed of construction is different. That's exactly what happened with the vaccine, also in terms of uh, uh, financial resources. And coming to specific and what EMA has done exactly the same, I created uh, early in March a task force where kind of 70 people were devoted exclusively to address the COVID development, whether vaccine or any other therapeutics. Similarly, the network, the European network, put uh, a lot of people uh, devoted exclusively to this. We also um, launched the rolling review, which is uh, um, never, never used before. What does it mean? Instead of collecting the data for uh, months and then start to look at the data when the dossier is, complete, is completed, we encourage the developer to come early, to share with us the, uh, the, 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 the study design, to share with us the quality data and the initial data as they came. That's facilitated. We started, in fact, to work uh, in May, in June, when the first data were coming. At, then, at the end of the day, we put the same time, but we uh, with a, a lot more resources per, per people is the same time that we use in one year, but we, we were able to uh, to make uh, that more efficient and more focused. Sure. So that concertina happened essentially because of this massive investment of resources, of brains, of energy, of commitment. And this analogy of the, of the bridge is a very, very clear one to everyone. So did EMA have different safety and efficacy requirements for COVID-19 vaccines compared to other vaccines and medicines that you're reviewing and evaluating on an ongoing basis, just to be clear and to delve a little deeper on this question? No, th this is a very crucial question because the time uh, uh, sometimes may make people uh, doubtful about uh, if you have uh, reduced uh, the request. No, it was not the case. Uh, and I can tell you, um, in terms of numbers and in terms of magnitude of the study, uh, was even much higher than, than the, all the vaccine we, we, we approved uh, the last 25 years. Uh, we never enjoyed to have 40,000 volunteers per study in a phase three. And that's, uh, I, I go back to what I said before, because the availability uh, and the exposure of volunteers has been constant and, and uh, global. Um, in May, we had a very important uh, meeting, uh, us, the FDA, and other 25 authorities worldwide. And we decided first, uh, we would not uh, accept uh, any study without a, a proper classical phase three, because there was the hypothesis to authorize in phase two. We say, no, we want a phase three. Second, we decided not to go below 50% efficacy. We will not even consider to approve. That was a very long debate because you can say in a pandemic, even 30% uh, is something. We say, no, we won't accept. A, to push the developers to, to, to strive for better. And as you know, we enjoyed now uh, at least two vaccines above 90% efficacy. So uh, in a, a, the, the short answer is no, we, we, we had even more than we used to have in a short and more efficient way. Sure, great. And I think you've um, developed that question and we can skip the next one um, uh, because I think you've, you've covered that very, very clearly. Um, 
I don't think we need to delve into into this one. So we can move now into the question of long term effects. What can we know about the long term effects of the vaccines? And I'd kick off with you, Guido, and then perhaps Jean-Michel might want to chip in afterwards. Guido, first of all. Well, uh, what can we know about the long term effect? Uh, uh, of course, we cannot uh, predict uh, everything. We can extrapolate some prediction from other technology. Remember that, as Jean-Michel correctly said, the first vaccine approved the, the messenger RNA technology. However, it's not the first medicine. We already approved some cancer medicine. And so we already have some observation about the MRA long term. Uh, even if for cancer, the long term is, uh, is what we want to pursue. What is uh, uh, our observation is that uh, the mRNA uh, effect uh, lasts uh, too short to have uh, uh, to have a um, concern about long term. We are striving for the opposite to have a more last, long lasting effect in other terms. That's uh, about the mRNA. Uh, mRNA for the other vaccine, we can say that. Uh, um, all the technology are quite uh, quite well known and quite uh, well used. The, the, the vectors, the protein, the inactivated uh, um, virus, and we already know that in the long term uh, we 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 cannot uh, expect any any surprise. Um, I'm very confident in this. Uh, if the question is whether the, the, the immunity will last, uh, that is another aspect. Mm -hmm. We don't know, but uh, the, the, the reassuring fact is that every month uh, that uh, is elapsing, we can see that the first people that enrolled in the early days in the, um, in the trials, in the clinical studies, are in fact, uh, seems to, be, to maintain their protection. But that is something we can, uh, we can tell you only month by month, we can add one more. Sure, sure. No, that makes that makes sense. Any additional comments, Jean-Michel? Just to say that uh, we have also in place a system of pharmacovigilance that has been specifically developed at EU level and in different member states for this vaccine. So this is called the post authorization safety study program, which are part of the risk management plan of this vaccine. And we have established a core risk management plan for which the different uh, manufacturers have to follow, uh, to uh, especially for the post authorization safety studies. On top of that, uh, the European Medicine Agencies has proposed some programs to develop, such as the Access Program, to develop as much as possible data on the background incidence rate of the adverse events of special interest. What is the interest of that? Is that if you have adverse even reported in the ultra vigilance database, you can put them in context, the observed cases in the context of expected cases. And so all of these events will be assessed in a way that we can put them in the context of the uh, uh, expected cases. So there is a huge post authorization safety program by the companies, but also by the regulators at EU level and at national level to study the long term safety. Great. And on that topic, then, any additional comments to make? This was a specific question, actually, Guido, a little later on in the interview, how EMA is monitoring safety and efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccines. Anything to supplement some of the work that is happening around risk management that Jean-Michel described? Uh, well, uh, no, um, the, the, the pharma, we, we, as uh, he said, we have the traditional pharmacovigilance, which is imposed to uh, the, 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 the company. Uh, we have this additional program that is with uh, cooperation between EMA and the ACDC. And there are a lot of initiatives uh, in the member state uh, that uh, some of them uh, are linked to the one, uh, the platform that uh, EMA uh, and the ACDC with the support of the commission uh, have put uh, in place. In addition, remember that uh, um, EMA is very keen to maintain for each vaccine the conditional market authorization. Among the conditions, there are some specific studies, including the risk management plan 
and some specific uh, uh, studies if, where needed, where there are not complete, uh, uh, when there are some uh, some questions that remain open to, to be answered as quick as possible. Okay, very good, very good. So, um, looking again at specific cohorts of the population and looking at um, different groups, for example, older people, children, young people and ethnic minorities, um, has there been sufficient testing in those specific cohorts, those particular population groups. And a second question that is somewhat related, and that comes strongly from our young patient leader community, what about possible issues linked to fertility and pregnancy? And I'd like to pose the question to, to both of you to get your thoughts on what is really critical given the audience that we're talking to today in the webinar. Guido, please, if you could kick off on that. Yeah, no, thank you. These are two very important questions. I'm so happy that are here to, to make, to clarify a lot of aspects. Um, group of people, old people and ethnic minorities, uh, uh, we have uh, very uh, different vaccines uh, use different population. This is clearly, will be clearly stated by the uh, regulatory authority, by EMA, which when we release the, the, the authorization will uh, certainly address uh, if there are restrictions or if there are gap, gaps uh, of knowledge in this. Of course, not all the pop, all, all the subgroup and not all the ethnic minorities has been studied, even though some of the study has been uh, held uh, in different countries. So sometimes it's covered, sometimes it's not. But this will be clarified in the in the authorization. Also, as I said, is a conditional market authorization, which means that one of the typical conditions. Uh, require the, the requirement and the condition are please keep going to fill the, the knowledge gap uh, in uh, ethnic group minorities and so far and so forth including pediatrics uh, including uh, uh, elderly where not included we already see that some some uh, uh, authorized vaccine are included are inclusive uh, some as are less and that is uh, to, to give to the uh, health authorities a tool that they know where to use and which population can be used or cannot. Uh, but the, the, the key question is fertility and pregnancy, I think. Yes. Well, about fertility, no, there is no any doubt. I know this is a, a, an old uh, uh, fear of the people and uh, is one of the building block of the vaccine hesitancy uh, of the Novax. Uh, there has been some, uh, I don't know why, but some uh, uh, popular belief that, uh, uh, and there was in some population outside Europe that, that they say that this is how Western people are trying to make us not fertile by vaccine. And this uh, fake news basically navigated and, and is a recurrent uh, problem, is the fertility affected of, from vaccine or not? The answer is no, absolutely. It has no any, any biological interaction, any mechanism interaction, any evidence. Uh, in the last, uh, uh, yes, on the opposite, an healthy uh, person without an infection is much more uh, likely to be fertile. So no any problem with fertility, no whatsoever. Be, be assured that that absolutely no link. About pregnancy, there is a discussion. Uh, for example, the, the Italian authority, IFA, said clearly, yes, you can vaccinate pregnant women, which I personally, this is my personal opinion, is yes. Uh, with the hope that my daughter will get pregnant soon, I will recommend the vaccine as soon as possible. If it's a little bit late in the pregnancy, well, you, you get two with one. <laughs> also, the baby will be some, somehow protected. So, no, in pregnancy, unless there are specific contraindications, and that is for the doctor who is following the, the, the pregnant um, woman to decide, but uh, there are no conceptual um, restrictions for pregnant women. This is at least as my position. But uh, over to Jean-Michel, who in terms of uh, pharmacovigilance, and this is, is more uh, 
more expert in clinics. Okay, go ahead, Jean-Michel, your thoughts. So I, I will focus on, on pregnancy and we have also about the breastfeeding and the fertility. I think the fertility, the concern was mainly because when it was first, uh, I would say, authorized uh, at the level of UK on the top of my head. And I remember that uh, there was the general information that no information is known about the fertility. Mm -hmm. And for many people, when they say no information, then it may create a doubt, then if you have a doubt, then it may create a risk. And now we have animal studies that do not indicate direct or indirect harmful effect with respect to the reproductive toxicity. So when you are against the vaccine in general, then you use everything that you can have in, in uh, and for instance, the absence of information, as if the, uh, there is an absence of information, then there is a risk. No, now we have indeed clear data. When it comes to fertility, pregnancy, and lactation, again, uh, at the, when it was authorized at the level of the MHRA in UK, there, there, there was strong recommendation not to use it and wait for two months before being pregnant if you have uh, used the, 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 the vaccines. So now they have also adapt, and at the EU level, we have also adapt based on the non-clinical data uh, of course, there was repeated uh, experience uh, with the vaccine in pregnant women because they were excluded from clinical trials. But animal studies do not indicate direct or indirect harmful effect with respect to the vaccines on the uh, embryo fetal development. And so uh, what is important is that the administration of the vaccine in pregnancy should be considered when it is considered by the MD, by the uh, uh, gynecologist, that the benefit outweighs the risks. And so this let open this recommendation at national level and for instance also at Belgium level we have said that we do not recommend a systematic uh, a vaccination campaign in pregnant women but the pregnant women or the women of childbearing potential may be vaccinated with the assessment on the benefit risk by the medical doctors or by the gynecologist. Okay. Okay, very clear messages from both of you. Thank you for that. This was a really, really critical point. So coming to you know a practical question on an individual basis, what should one do if one suspects a significant adverse reaction to a vaccine? I can start, but I don't dare match in, in the presence of a representative of the PRAC, which is <laughs> Jean-Michel. Well, basically, I think there are many channels for a patient, uh, for any one of us, uh, to flag a, a suspected adverse reaction. Uh, it can be uh, said to the doctor, and the doctor knows generally how to uh, fill this data uh, into the system. And this, I think, is the best way because uh, the wording and the way to describe an effect uh, with the proper uh, terminology, uh, of course, uh, uh, the doctor is the, the, the most, uh, uh, but the, the, you have many other channels, can be in, in some country are the pharmacists, uh, in some country, you can go directly in the EMA system, you can go directly, any country has different, uh, different channels, but one common element is to tell to your doctor and to avoid to tell to two to two, three t different channels because you duplicate uh, the, the, the signal in the central repository. So my, my recommendation is the first and the, the easiest one is tell to the doctor and explain. Okay. But I think Jean-Michel is much more expert uh, because he managed the, these signals. Yeah. Sure, so, and, and we're going back to pharmacovigilance legislation, I guess, of a few years ago. So, Jean-Michel, your, your perspective on that, and also so the direct indeed. direct patient reporting is quite interesting here. Isn't yeah, it? so indeed, back to 2012, we have the direct uh, reporting from the patient that are possible, and so it means that they will report directly in a website at uh, a member state level, and uh, all the 27 member states have this possibility to do so. Uh, so, of course, we cannot refrain any patient to do so. What mentioned Guido is quite important, Professor Hazi is quite important, is that if we want to have a more detailed report, we'd better have a report by a healthcare professional coming, of course, from a patient, because usually they are more detailed. And 
uh, when we have this report, we can come back also to the healthcare professional and discuss with him some additional details. When it comes to patient reporting, some can be anonymous, so it can be quite difficult to come back, of course. So the three ways is the patient directly to the to the to the um, pharmacovigilance center national level, the patient to a healthcare professional, and both are usually recognized as being the one who reports the most, the pharmacist and uh, the, the the medical doctors. And finally, we have also patients that may report directly to the pharmaceutical industry that can contact with the pharmaceutical industry. And then the pharmaceutical industry also has the obligation to report these events to uh, the national or directly to the international, to the European Medicine Agency. So these are the three ways. And I would let the patient the best. What is important is to report every event that they would suspect is associated to the vaccines and uh, whatever the way I would say, but report it uh, uh, hopefully to the to, to the system and not to complain in the media that they have an adverse event because we cannot do anything with that. Yeah, sure, sure, clear. A slightly different tack now, and this is directed to Guido. Um, in contrary to the earlier questions, some people are actually concerned that the EMA are approving vaccines more slowly than other regulators in other regions and in other countries. What would you say to that? What's your response there? Well, um, one way to address this is that uh, you need to be two to tango, which means uh, it, it's very important when the data are coming in and uh, which data are coming in. Let's take the example of the first vaccine approved, uh, which has been the, 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 the Pfizer BioNTech, uh, uh, that has been approved uh, uh, in US 21 day before, uh, no, 10 days before EMA, and has been submitted 10 days before at FDA, and then 10 days after in the, at EMA. That's exactly 21 days for both the authorities. The same set of data has been submitted with 10 days gap. So that's why if we don't have the, we don't have the data, we cannot approve. Mm -hmm. So the, the time in this case is, very, is a very good example of the perception versus the reality. Was exactly, exactly the same time when we have the phase three set of data. Uh, different uh, uh, aspect uh, is for the uh, MHRA. They issued a, an emergency use, which was, is a completely different setting. They practically authorized only once, uh, one batch of data, the batch of, of, uh, uh, that was used for the, um, the, 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 the clinical trial, which means that were an already approved batch of um, of vials of data of, of vaccine. EMA has to approve the all uh, quality for the plan from Finland to Cyprus. You need to have the same quality of the vials, the same absolutely. Uh, uh, you don't have to come back, so you have to approve a, a, a quite a plan. As, as the same of the US, which has to approve for, for all the 51 uh, state of the US. So it's not a single batch approval in an emergency use. It's a, it's a kind of full approval with a lot of. On top of this, uh, uh, MHRA possibly has taken an additional risk, which is uh, in their capacity. Uh, there is uh, a law, they use the a, a, a European law for the emergency use. Um, and they, they, they took a, a little risk is in their capacity. According to the CEO, uh, this, they, they, this, they give the same day to MA and to MHRA and the, MA, uh, the MHRA approved the next day, the UK. How they could uh, uh, analyze in one day uh, is for them to, to, to decide and to, to explain. Uh, however, I don't think that uh, was uh, a speed contest. And I think that at the end of the day, if you really check 
we use for the same kind of data the, the, the exactly the same time that is needed for major uh, stringent authority like FDA. Okay, thank you for that uh, very clear answer to a, a, a challenging question. We're now moving now to the, the wider Q&A and I'm pleased to say that there have been a number of, of questions coming through. Some of them have already been resolved in the context of the conversation and Marco is back on screen as well to join us in this Q&A. Um, let's just go through a couple of the questions now. Um, one relating to um, when people have already had COVID, they've acquired the antibodies, do they still need to take the vaccination to Guido and Jean-Michel? Yeah, very, very briefly. Where's Donier? You want to reply to this or you want me to? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, first, in the different clinical trials, some zero positive uh, individuals were uh, included. Um, the power of this study with these uh, zero positive patients does not allow to assess the efficacy data in this subgroup, but the safety data were in line with the safety on. Uh, zero negative uh, people. That's my first point. My second point is that the CDC as well clearly notified that there is no reason to uh, limit the vaccination in the zero positive population because it would mean that you need to test everybody first and so it's a burden, a cost and what you test does not give you the information if even if you are positive that you will not redo I would say the COVID-19 especially now that we know that we have some variants for which uh, the uh, immunogenicity induced by the previous uh, virus may be limited to act with the antibodies on these variants and we know that the vaccines especially the data that we have with mrna vaccines have more a uh, global approach a global with the antibodies the neutralizing antibodies are more global approach on the virus itself then i would say the natural immunity so it makes sense to vaccinate as well people who have already done the disease also we know that today uh, in the previous three months if you have had the disease the risk that you have again the disease is very limited but now with the variant we may expect to have something that is totally different and in Brasilia, we have a variance for which we had a population where we had 75% of the population in a region that was positive. So we expect to have a herd immunity. And now with the variance, we see that this immunity is not enough to, uh, to, to, to act on this uh, virus variant. So we would recommend that, but it may depend mm -hmm. on national level if you want to focus first on zero negative versus zero positive. Thank you. And Guido, any comments? No, I, I, I agree. I agree. This is very is evidence and is very logical. Yeah. Some okay. authorities in the shortest of vaccine might decide to give priority to the others and maybe not to vaccinate who had has had the, the disease three months apart. But in, in concept, uh, uh, there is no, no reason to, to avoid uh, the vaccination. It can be just a strategy, a local strategy under uh, a, a social pressure, but nothing more than that. Okay, and another question coming through, and we've touched on that, we've uh, that somebody has come in with, with um, another question about the variants and how we can upgrade the vaccines, but I think we looked at that earlier on in the conversation. How vaccines actually interact with specific medicines, treatments, etc. Again, we touched upon that briefly, but it's come up. I think it's an important one for our communities. Any comments on that? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, first, we did not do interaction studies with the vaccines. Uh, again, what we have from the CDC and as a general recommendation, if you have to do two vaccines at the same time, it's proposed to have a delay of 14 days in between a COVID-19 vaccine and any other vaccine, for instance. So this is a general recommendation. Of course, now we are not anymore in the flu vaccination campaign. So usually people that will be vaccinated from now on uh, up to, I would say, October, they will usually have only the COVID-19 vaccine. Maybe they will have also the pneumo vaccine. If they have the pneumo vaccine, then it is proposed to have a two weeks uh, of, uh, in between the, the two vaccines. 
When it comes to small molecules, I would say, or to other medicines, um, we have no hard evidence, but as I have said, there are studies with people that are immunocompromised with immunomodulators, they can still be uh, vaccinated. And when it comes also to the adverse events, we have seen that in the clinical trials, the use of paracetamol, for instance, can be used to limit some of the events, but not as a prophylactic in everybody, but if the symptoms appear, you can use it. You, you can use it. And the same is true also for anticoagulant. This was a question, but people with anticoagulant disorder or un-anticoagulant can be vaccinated, but they just that they may be aware that they might increase the bruising or the bleeding at the site of injections. Okay. Anything to add, Guido? No, I, I think it's very exhaustive. Indeed, indeed. Good. There's a question come through specifically for you, Marco. Um, and again, it's about EPF's broader work and, and mandate, let's say. What role do you think patient organisations have in terms of building confidence, vaccine confidence, and actually addressing some of the hesitancies that we've, we've, we've witnessed over the last few months and indeed years? I believe they will play a core role, an essential one in, uh, in building confidences. Uh, after all, we are patients. We are not only representing patients. We are representing patients because we are patients. And so we need to find the key to better communicate with the community we do represent. We need to, to keep on trying till we do not find the, the right uh, approach. It's virtually impossible to, to, to convince everybody that that's a matter of fact. That doesn't mean that we should uh, make any step back. Uh, we should work on different levels. Um, that means, uh, on the one hand, to cooperate with the authorities in order to uh, work together for developing very clear communication strategies. This event is indeed intersection. Secondly, we need to promote also uh, a political change because here the, the one of the main issues of vaccine exigency is that we do not teach science anymore in schools. <laughs> That's the point. That's the point because I mean if you have a basic knowledge of science, then you are more receptive to, to the message and you you are more capable to understand what is uh, crap and what is real information. That's the point. I, I never criticize people for uh, uh, not understanding science because very often the problem is that fake science is three times, ten times easier to be understood than real science. That means that we should teach better science. That's, that's evident. And that creates a lot of troubles because you have to find the resources, you have to, to move many things for getting there. But yeah. our role is, a patient organization is to, to take also a positive change in society. And this is part of it. Yeah, sure. And this whole kind of health literacy backdrop is critical here as well. Great. Thank you very much. Another big question, it is a biggie, and I'm going to ask all of you your views on this, is um, that of compensation when there is serious adverse events. Again, there's been conversations at European level, various governments have been looking at that as well. What, broadly speaking, are your individual and perhaps organisational perspectives here? And I would kick off, um, yeah, and maybe you'll, you'll be speaking in a personal capacity now, Guido, what's your view on this? Well, I'm the least knowledgeable on this uh, because, uh, uh, as you know, EMA uh, has to stay far for any commercial um, aspect of this. And uh, also in the benefit risk determination, we don't have to insert any other variable. And that is for the to reassure all the patient that we were looking only at the scientific benefit risk side and uh, um, by mentality i was so far that i'm i'm, I'm really now ignorant about any possible uh, uh, best setting uh, even if i understand that, 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 that how serious is the problem but i, I don't really have any 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 uh, any tool to to understand what is fair what is not 
Okay. So okay. my apology, but my ignorance he prevent me to to give a contribution in this specific question. No, but you've made it clear the distance that EMA needs to take from this kind of discourse, and I think that's an important yeah. point for right. all of us together. Jean Michel. So if Guido said that he is ignorant in this field, uh, he has found his master, <laughs> because I am as well ignorant in this field, and indeed I'm focusing made uh, on on hard data, but I, I can still answer from a personal point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, the industry has still, as for any medicine, obligations in terms of data on their products, both on benefits and risks, even if they have a conditional marketing authorization. And Professor Razi mentioned that this is a conditional marketing authorization. They have obligation to conduct, to continue conducting study. They have obligation to have risk management plan with post authorization safety studies, randomized clinical trials, epidemiological studies to assess the safety in some population, pregnant women to assess the safety in immunocompromised populations, to assess the data on safety when they got data. So even at national level, if you have safety concerns, it's still the responsibility of the industry to work on this safety concern together with the authority, the European Medicine Agency. And so they need to be involved. So this is not a lack of responsibility. All this responsibility remains and they are put up on a lot of pressure to do additional studies. When it comes now to individual compensation, I think these are discussions at national level, and I will let the floor to Marco because it's more, uh, I would say, a legal uh, discussion at individual level where you need and when you and what you expect to go if you want to have your adverse event recognized and to have a compensation of that. Okay, so the floor is yours, Marco, to have a, a legal perspective and, and, and indeed, I imagine, a political perspective as well. Please. Thank you. Uh, I would start with a very short step back. Uh, compensation programs originated, legally speaking, for two reasons and politically speaking. The first one is actually to, to take a, uh, a potential step back from companies scared by the so-called punitive damages in, uh, and this has emerged particularly in those legal systems in which these kind of damages are recognized, so common law system, basically American law. Uh, the second reason why these kind of programs have been developed historically is to take all vaccine exigencies, you know? because people very often say, okay, we are scared about taking this vaccine because if something happens, it will take years through the legal system to get the compensation. It will take a lot of money in legal expenses, in uh, expert expenses to get the, uh, the damage to be compensated. So in this sense, uh, these kind of programs may have a, a reason. But uh, if these, are two, these two points are the origin, the first one is not a real problem for the very simple reason that in Europe we don't have compensative compensation um, and uh, punitive damages in this kind uh, of, uh, of issues. So it may have a sense if we want to convince, particularly in certain areas of Europe, in convincing people that are scared about the potential side effects of vaccine, that in the case of a problem, the compensation will be faster, will be easier. But it's not an easy, subject because I mean a compensation program as may have a sense if there is for example an inversion of the burden of proof from the patient perspective so I may be interested in accepting this kind of program as a citizen if I know that if I will have a, an adverse reaction I will be compensated faster because I will not have to demonstrate the casualty link be between the vaccine and my adverse reaction because these will be reversed on the company so at the moment the programs that were uh, uh, suggested till now didn't take this these kind of programs were started by the way interestingly by the <clears throat> reagan administration in the united states after a huge compensation given by a court against a vaccine side effect okay so it's it's normal to think about this kind of system 
but there are other things that we need. So first, in Europe, these kind of programs may work only if it will be managed by the European Commission and by the national and, and by the national government, so the member states. Uh, we cannot think about in Europe about a compensation program uh, in, entirely led uh, by companies. Second, this system makes sense uh, uh, only if we concede in, in certain cases, because in Europe, the European Commission made very clear that will be no step back from the product liability legislation. So as Jean-Michel said, this legislation is there and will still be applied. So if you, if you produce something, you are liable from what you produce. Here, there is another issue that is at stake, and it is good faith and chain of trust between the, the consumer and the producer. If you play fairly, no court actually will punish you. One thing is to give a compensation, and one other is to punish. If, when, we, when legally there has been uh, a punitive damage given to a company, 99% of the cases it was because the company was hiding data or there was, or there was problem in the communication about that. So if good faith is there, if we play openly and with transparency, I'm not sure we really need these uh, for tackle the problem. I still see the advantages of a potential European-led compensation plan, for particularly for convincing the poorest country in Europe to join vaccination programs and to make easier for patients to get the compensation. If it is something like that, it makes sense in our legal system. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Longer. No, no, that's, that's really, about that. <laughs> indeed. We we heard and felt your passion. Thank you. We're moving towards the last five minutes of the uh, session. And I just encourage people who would like to tweet about what they're learning, some of their reflections to do that. Hashtag shot callers, as we said earlier. Three other topics have come up. And we have too little time to really delve into them, but I'm just going to put them out there and I'd like to give each of you a minute just to kind of sum up your your main sort of thoughts, ideas, as it were, on this topic. We had one uh, one kind of question about the current ombudsman scrutiny on the transparency of the vaccine deals. We had a question about the merits or otherwise of a vaccine passport and of course shortages and the current strong discussions, let's say, between the institutions and companies around supply shortages, etc., of COVID-19 vaccines. Those are things that are, are peppering the conversation right now. We can't possibly answer those in the last four minutes and we will continue that conversation with EPF and our community but I just wanted to put those out there as, as things that people are, are reflecting on but in the last sort of few few minutes I'd just like to give each of you the floor to sum up in one or two sentences where you are with the COVID-19 vaccines again perhaps emphasizing a key point from the conversation the very good conversation we've had over the last hour or so and perhaps I'd like to give the floor firstly to Jean-Michel. Okay so on the three point transparency vaccine passport and shortage I will be short hopefully I think that I understand the question on transparency and where I'm working at national level and at the EMEA they have put a transparency system in place that has never been seen. We have published a full risk management plan, we have published the EPA within three days after the marketing authorization. When it comes now to the contract with the European Commission, I think that is mainly for commercial reasons that there are this kind of uh, non disclosure of the information. But I understand that I, it's good to have the ombudsman that will look at this. And this is all that I can say, but uh, this is not seen at the level of the EMEA, nor at national level, the lack of transparency, which is my domain. When it comes to the vaccine passport, I think it's too soon. If you cannot vaccinate everybody and you do not have vaccine for everybody, and if you do not know if the vaccine protects from transmission of the disease, what is the aim of having a vaccine passport? Since you cannot have the obligation to be vaccinated and you do not have vaccine for everybody and you do not know if you will still transmit the disease, if you are vaccinated. So I think it's a bit too early to discuss that uh, now, uh, in, uh, especially at EU level. And finally, the shortages is, of course, of main concern. I do not know if it's shortages. What is, what is it? Is that we have 
more demands than we have of offer of vaccines. And it was anticipated since we knew that we would not have all the vaccine from all the company at one, at one time when they will be marketed. So I think we have been maybe too optimistic and too, too, we have been trusted too much that now everybody wants to be vaccinated. We have uh, surveys in Belgium showing that uh, before Christmas, less than 50% wanted to be vaccinated. And now we have more than 90% in some groups that want to be vaccinated. <laughs> So this yeah. is not only the shortages, but the fact that everybody wants to have a vaccine, but we knew that there were uh, less vaccines than available. So, of course, we can urge to rapidly vaccinate as much as possible. OK, thank you. Again, very, very briefly, Guido, perhaps not going on the, the topics per se, because we'll revisit those again, but just your, your last thoughts, let's say. No, my last thought is that many of the answers we, we gave today has been already clarified and self uh, uh, 49 million people have got the vaccine, so safety is not an issue anymore. Efficacy, we will see uh, as soon as you can get get it. And uh, but wary and be patient because uh, this is a global concomitant uh, attempt to vaccinate the globe together. But behave uh, safely until you get your vaccine. And that is my. Final message. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guido. Very, very clear. And the last word to Marco. Thank you, Nicola. Well, uh, a lot of things, very interesting things emerged today. Um, I would say just three words. Uh, the first one is transparency is essential, is a value for us. Um, we have been claiming for transparency uh, in different fields when it comes to COVID-19. I want to thank personally Emma because it was really transparent and open to, to us. Uh, the fact that uh, for the first time, it was uh, two meetings were organized open to patients with Emma open to receive direct questions from uh, the public. I think uh, it, it has happened only in Europe and it, it is a great signal of the cooperation between the patient community and the regulatory authorities. We have also claimed for transparency about the contract. Um, APF was in favor uh, understanding also the, the issues uh, about uh, the, the, the potential issues uh, raised by the European Union and uh, by Sante about that. So we were in favor of the data room. We were honestly expecting a bit more transparency. But here now it's a, it's a different thing. We are not discussing about the, the price and some of the agreements we are discussing about if we are in, executing the contract uh, with good faith. That is another thing. And it's something we need to be very clear and we want to get uh, clarity on. On uh, access and shortages, well, these are two top uh, themes for uh, the patient community since many years, uh, access in particular for APF. Uh, we have been working a lot at the beginning of the pandemic thinking uh, about how to tackle vaccine efficacy. Now we are having the issue of uh, access and shortages because in some country of the coast, in some other about because it's, uh, it's not available. It's clear that it's the first time that it's happening to the necessity to produce so many vaccines at the, in, in a short period. Uh, on a personal basis, I consider indeed a miracle that we managed to develop uh, a scientific miracle to develop a vaccine so fastly. Uh, clearly, some uh, production issue may have uh, raised, uh, but they need to be real production issues and not okay. Like Thank you very much, Marco. We're a couple of minutes over, but it was really, really important to get your concluding thoughts. I'd like to thank all of you, particularly Guido Razi, Jean-Michel Donnier, for your fantastic contribution and ongoing support to EPF. It is very much appreciated. I'd like to thank all of the participants that helped to build the interviews and for your insightful questions during the course of the session. And most of all, I'd like to thank, well, also, I'd like to thank the EPF team who are as agile and as active and as dynamic as always. And, and Marco, thank you 
again for your leadership in bringing this to the fore really really important i look forward to the feedback on twitter and indeed we'll be following up with a report and in fact broadcasting this session so that more and more of our community can benefit from the insights and wisdom of today thank you all very very much i wish you all a, you. a nice afternoon thank you thank you very much bye thank you bye-bye thank you bye-bye bye-bye bye-bye